All right, so we're continuing on in our series on, uh, you know, basically end times events. Last week we went over and did kind of a, a broad overview of the, of the book of Revelation. And now we're just going to start digging into various topics that we find throughout all end times prophecy type of events. So um, tonight we're going to be covering Revelation 17 and 18. And really, tonight's going to be real, pretty much like a Bible study. It's going to be real similar to our Wednesday night Bible study. Because the topic that we're covering is Babylon, the great whore, and the beast. And these, the, the, almost all of the information that we're going to see about this is found in Revelations chapter 17 and 18. This is where the, just, I mean, al literally almost everything is going to be found about this subject. There's um, a lot of people have different opinions on who these various things are and they, who they represent and whatever. Um, the first thing that I want to point out when we look here, and we're going to read through Revelation 17 again, and we're going to read through Revelation 18, just to get everything. I'm kind of going to preach through some of them. We're going to skip around a little bit, not necessarily going to hit every single verse, but um, we're, we're going to look at this very closely. And the first thing I want to point out is that you don't want to get confu anything confused between the whore and the beast. Because they're two, they're two different things. They're two different, you know, people or characters who have different representations of, what, of who they are and, and what the Bible's talking about with them. So, first we're just going to look at the beast. So, look at verse number 3 here in Revelation chapter 17. The Bible says, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So the first thing that we see about the beast, this is, and this, is, this has the whore and the, the beast in the same verse, because it's talking about the woman, the woman's a whore, is sitting on top of this beast. This is the vision that John sees, and he's going to get all this stuff explained to him. right? So the vision is there's this woman, there's a scarlet or a red-colored beast, and the beast itself has seven heads, and ten horns. I mean, try to picture what he's seeing. It's all symbolic, though, so you know, don't worry too much. It's not like this is a real beast that actually has seven literal heads. These are figurative heads. Seven heads and ten horns. Uh, jump down to verse number nine and explains exactly what those heads mean. So it says, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So the woman sitting on the beast, the beast is who actually has the seven heads. And those seven heads, it says, is represent seven mountains. So from this one phrase right here, you know, a lot of people have different uh, opinions on where, you know, oh, it's a city. And, and unfortunately, I think some people start to mix up the whore as being, you know, on the seven mountains because it says that the woman sits on the seven mountains, but the woman's sitting on the beast. And the beast is, is what has those seven heads, which represent the seven mountains. So the seven mountains can refer to, a, I, I'm kind of open interpretation on this a little bit on what it actually means. There's, you know, Rome is obviously known as a, as a city that's on seven hills or seven mountains, but Jerusalem can also be a, a place that's known for a place that has seven mountains. And I actually did some research on this. There's a bunch of places that have seven mountains like in its proximity or, you know, as a city that would, that kind of have names of the city of, of seven mountains. But by and large, the most popular one is Rome. I mean, that's like the, the, the most popular place that has that. So if this is referring to uh, a place that we know of today, uh, Rome would be, seems to be a good fit for, for lining up with seven mountains. But this is referring again, the beast is the one that has the seven heads, okay, which are the seven mountains, not the whore. Look at verse number seven here. And the, an angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten hordes. So the, the whore rides upon the beast, but the whore sits upon many Water. So um, we're going to get into that. I know my, my notes are just a little bit out of order. We're going to get to that in just a minute. I just wanted, I just want to point that out, though, so it's clear in your mind that in verse seven it says, "I will tell you the mystery of the woman 
and of the beast that carrieth her. So the, the, the beast is, is carrying the woman. Obviously, she's sitting on it. And, um, and the beast is helping the woman because she's, she's riding on it. But ultimately, the beast is going to turn on the woman. Um, look at verse number 8 there of Revelation 17. The Bible says, The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. So we see here that the beast is, is talking about the Antichrist who was and is not and yet is. Who's going to be powered by Satan and um, is going to go into perdition. He's the son of perdition, right? So that's a little bit about the beast. There's not a whole lot of detail given about the beast here, but um, I just wanted to get that in your minds that the beast is talking about something different than, uh, than the woman. Now, let's look at the whore. And the first thing to understand, it uses these names. Like when he uses the name the whore, the great whore, it's being descriptive for a very good reason. We, everyone knows what a whore is, right? A hooker, a harlot. Is, some, is, a, is a woman that, that sells her body for money. And when you start thinking about the attributes of a whore, these are the same attributes that this city has that is being referred to as the great whore. Um, a whore deceives. It could be deceitful, right? A whore allures through the lust of the flesh and is, is trying to, to get people, tries to defile as many men as possible, trying to get as many people to lie with her for her own gain, for her own profit, and does so in a, in a very lewd way, a very you know, disgusting way, a very base way. Right? I mean, that's what, that's what a whore is. So th this is like, this is describing the attributes of a city that's filthy, that's defiled, that's promiscuous. Those are all things that a, that a whore is. Look at verse number one here in Revelation 17. The Bible says that the horse sits upon many waters. It says, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. We already saw that she was riding on a beast. But here it says that she sits upon many waters. Verse 15 explains what that waters is representative of. Verse 15 says, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So this whore, this great city, which verse 18, just jump down to verse 18 real quick. The Bible says, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. You're saying, why is a great whore city? That's what it says right here in verse 18. The woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So this, this, this woman, this whore, is representative of a great city that's reigning over the kings of the earth at this time that um, is also sitting on waters, but the waters are representative of peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So tongues, I mean, different languages, different nations. So this is the, the horse sitting on and, and having influence over pretty much the whole world is what we're seeing here. Multitudes, nations, tongues, and in a position of power and ruling and reigning. Basically, this is a big empire, right? Being, being ruled from this great city and this influence that's going out of the world. Now, another attribute of a whore is that a whore moves around and has no loyalty, right? There's no, there's no loyalty at all, just to herself. And the kings, in, verse, in chapter 17, the other kings of the earth end up getting fed up with the whore. They end up getting fed up with that great city, and they finally just move to destroy her. Look at verse number 16. The Bible says, In the ten horns, this is the ten horns on the beast, which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So the Bible's talking about this great whore, which is a city that has influence and power over the whole world, that is defiling the whole world with her fornications and her wickedness and her sorceries. 
we know that the Antichrist, or the beast, is going to one day have set up his own one world government and, and be at the, the head of that. And the way that, that he's going to come into power is that the other kings of the earth are going to give the beast their power. That's ultimately what's going to happen. Prior to that, though, you have this whore that's been doing all this work in the background where ultimately all of the whore's lovers are going to turn on her and destroy her and want to have nothing to do with her. Two different things. The whore versus the beast. It's, it, we've got to keep uh, remember, making sure we, we remember that. Revelation 18 describes the total destruction of the once rich and glorious whore. And it's very clear that the city will be utterly destroyed and inhabitation of devils. Now, before I even get into all that, I kind of want to go through verse by verse. We, went, we jumped around quite a bit because I put them in, in um, the verses together that talked about the whore and that talked about the beast. Now let's read, read through it in Revelation chapter 17 again, having that in mind. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So this wicked city, this wicked whore, is sleeping around, if you will, with the various kings of the earth. They're all having their own dealings with the whore. And she's spewing out her filth and making the inhabitants of the earth drunk with the wine of her fornication. So, I mean, if you think about it today, this isn't very difficult, but you think about the filth of the world and, and how, how much influence and impact like the media has and how very few, how, how, how very limited the, the source of information is. And when you think about um, the entire world and, in, and inhabitants of the earth, being made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Everywhere, anywhere you go in the world, you're going to find movies, TV shows, everything coming from the West. Cultural influence through mass media being pushed out all over the place in the West. The, the, the rock bands, the, you know, the musicians, movies, everything is like, it all gets put into all these various languages. Now, here, we don't get all of their stuff. We have very, very, very little of it. But the source that has the vast influence over the world of, of this culture and stuff, you have to say, I mean, at this moment in time where we are right now, it's coming from here. It's coming from the West. It's coming from the United States. Look at verse number three. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting, sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now the names of blasphemy, what's blasphemous is because this beast is going to claim to be God and stand in the temple of God, which is you know, what the Antichrist is going to do when he comes into power. So these are the names of blasphemy on this beast. Okay, Verse number uh, four, And the woman was arrayed in purple, and scarlet color, so very fancy, very flashy, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And again, just to go to the point where it says that last phrase are the abominations of the earth. This is this is this whore's name. I mean, this city just is stamped with and stands for this type of wickedness. Mother of harlots, abominations of the earth. And honestly, like the, the moral depravity that is just being pushed out onto the entire world. You cannot say at this time it's coming from anywhere else more strongly than it is from here. I mean, you, could, you can see how much influence the United States government has over other governments of the world and just kind of pushing this agenda in to, you know, even to the culture. There's, a lot, there's some countries out there still that are trying to, to ban U.S. influence and, and not allow certain things on YouTube, so, you know, their own video sources and their own media information because it goes against, the, you know, it, we're in a sad state when you have Muslims who are, who are trying to be more righteous 
than you know, supposedly Christian America on standards, on what's filthy, on fornication, on you know, these types of things. That's sad. That's the sad state of affairs when you have, when you have people like that there is just saying, no, this is filthy, this is wicked, coming from this Christian nation, you know, we don't want to see any of this stuff. But it's being pumped into their countries nonetheless. Look at verse number six. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So obviously this city is responsible for killing Christians, killing saints, blood of martyrs, the martyrs of Jesus. And he says, uh, when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And this, is, I believe, is referring to the deadly wound that the beast receives that is healed. Then, and the world wonders at that. And there's going to be, the beast is going to be performing these, these lies and miracles and, and lying wonders. The Antichrist is going to deceive, the Bible says in Matthew 24, even if it were possible, the very elect. It's just going to be a very strong delusion brought on the people at that time, those that are unsaved, and they're going to marvel at this. It's going to be wondrous in their sight. And it says, they're going to wonder. So he's, he's saying to John, like, like, why are you marveling and wondering at this? These people are going to be wondering at that, uh, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast which was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. We saw that already. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the, the eighth and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Talking about being the eighth king. He's of the seven. He comes out of the seven and becomes the eighth king, which has total power then because all the other kings give him power. It says in uh, verse 12, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no, no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So, and again, this is taking place now this, at this period of time when God's wrath is being poured out, right near the end of God's wrath, when, you know, I mean, these nations still exist and, and, and the power still exists. And it says these kings are going to make war with the Lamb and the Lamb shall overcome them. He's Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen faithful. Verse 15, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So now we're going to read in, in chapter 18 now how, um, how the great whore, that great city, which is also called Babylon, because verse 5 there in chapter 17 said that upon her forehead, talking about the whore, was mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. That was the name of the whore, not the beast. Verse 18, or excuse me, chapter 18. Chapter 18, verse 1. The Bible says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. This is talking about the destruction of Babylon or the great whore, that great city. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Now, before I even read any further, for, for me personally, this, this chapter 
pretty much without a doubt, if we were to look at these events happening anytime soon, I don't see how you could come up with any other place in the world as being representative of a place like this other than the United States of America. Now, if you want to say it's a city, pick out a city in the United States of America. It's coming from here somewhere. Um, I don't know. Obviously, no man knows the day or the hour when Christ is going to come back. So my position on this subject, on, on who Babylon is and, and um, you know, how this fits in, how, who the great whore is, who Babylon, I believe the Babylon is representative today in our, li in our life right now is representative and, and found in the United States. Now, if Jesus Christ doesn't come back for another couple hundred years, this could change. I don't know. I mean, I think we're in the last days. I think it's going to happen very soon. I know there's a lot of people that feel the same way. And the reason why I say as we get into this, you're going to see how much wealth the great whore has, how much influence it has, and, and just, you know, the merchants of the ship. We're going to get into it. We're going to read every passage. But when you start reading this, just think, who can be, you know, because some of the people, some people say it's Rome, some people say it's Jerusalem, some people just have whatever. I mean, just other opinions on what this is talking about. But as you're thinking about different places, you should at least be able to eliminate like, like, well, that place isn't like this. That place isn't consuming all of the world's goods. This place, you know what I mean? This is a good way of ruling out if you're just to look at this, honestly, of what's going on today, where are we at in the world? And, and honestly, it, it, it makes sense that, um, you know, the United States fits into end times prophecy. Now, it's not in a good way at all, but I believe that it fits in perfectly here when we read these descriptions. Let's start reading here in verse number, uh, we, yeah, we started in, let's reread verse number three. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And again, the filth that this country puts out and the influence that the culture has worldwide is just uh, unmatched. It really is. Uh, the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Delicacies is just, it's, it's just her over, overwhelming richness, right? The delicacies, the, 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 the finer things, the greater things. You know, it's not talking about a poor city. A poor place because if you're indulging in delicacies you already have a lot of money but let's keep reading here verse number four and I heard another voice from heaven saying come out of her my people that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues because God's gonna destroy this this city it's good the destruction is coming so whoever is left in this and, and I believe when saying to come out of her my people I think this is talking about people because I do believe there's going to be people getting saved even during when God's pouring his wrath out on this earth. You know, people like to use this, come out of her, my people, you know, like, and apply it all over the place. I think this is pretty specific. I think this is talking about during those last times when the judgment's finally coming down on Babylon. And he's saying, look, my people, if you're in there, get out of there because the plagues are coming. You don't want to be anywhere close to being in that... Um, in this wicked city. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works. In the cup which she filled, hath filled, fill to her double. How much she hath glorified herself, and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. And this is where God is recompensing, right? Her wicked ways and her own thoughts. He's, he's doubling unto the, the city the, the attitude that, that the city had. Verse number eight, with the exact opposite stuff. So verse number eight, therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire for strong is the Lord who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off 
for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. So uh, the one hour time frame is mentioned more than once. This is something that's going to happen very quick. The destruction is going to happen and everyone's just going to be like, whoa. You know, this was this rich, powerful city, this, this beauty. You know, I mean, I, I just keep thinking of like Las Vegas, right? This decadent place where people have all these delicacies and, and these big structures and you got the, you know, the pyramids and, every, and, and everything else there. And it's this big, you know, wonder to look at. And it's full of sin and perversion and, and fornication and, and, and everything else, right? But it's this magnificent place where it has all this money and all this lavishness and all these delicacies. And he's saying in one hour, you're wiped off. You're wiped. You're, you're, you're completely done. And the, the people of the earth, the merchants of the earth, they're going to see it and they're going to be standing. They're going to be standing far off, away from it. They won't even get close to the destruction and they're just kind of, you know, lamenting the loss of Babylon. Verse number 11, And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. Look at this. I mean, think about, think about what city today referring, or what place Right? This is talking about city, but what place? If, if this place was just removed, that the merchants of the world are going to say, who's going to buy our stuff? I mean, who's left? Who, who do we have that's going to buy our stuff? America is like the number one consumer by far of the goods in this world. We're not a producer. I mean, nothing's made in the USA anymore, practically. We all this junk from China, from India, from Japan, from all over the world. The world is supplying us with all of our goods. We are, if the United States were to go down economically, the world's going to say, what are we going to do now? We're manufacturing all of this junk and who's going to buy it? The merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thyan wood and all manner of vessels of ivory, and all manner of vessels of most precious wood, and of brass, and iron, and marble, and cinnamon, and odors, and ointments, and frankincense, and wine, and oil, and fine flour, and wheat, and beasts, and sheep, and horses, and chariots, and slaves, and souls of men. And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee. And all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee. And thou shalt find them no more at all. The merchants of these things, which were made rich by her, shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour, again, there's a reference again, one hour. For in one hour so great riches is come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company in ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off. That's another important point. It's talking about people in ships and the shipmasters and the people who are bringing their wares, the, the stuff to sell by boat, by ship into this great city. Which, again, I mean, there's not very many places on the earth that have such a vast ocean import into their place. We've got it on east and west coast in the United States. Not every country fits this bill. I mean, think about it. Like, what, what if Rome were destroyed? If Rome burned to the ground? Is the whole world going to be like, who's going to buy our stuff now? I mean, who, who's going to buy it? Rome's gone. Who's going to buy our stuff? It's not going to happen. What, what if it happened in Jerusalem? I mean, literally, like, like there's so few people even in Israel in general. Right? We're talking about the Jews, right? It's, it's a, such a small percentage of the population. I mean, if Jerusalem were to burn the ground, is the, is the world just going to be... I mean, there, there's half the world is trying to make them burn down to the ground <laughs> as it is already. Why, well, how is that going to affect the whole world economy and everyone just going, oh man, what are we going to do? That rich city is gone. It's, that's not it. 
And those are the two most common, I mean, and I think part of the problem is because people are confusing Babylon with the beast, with the seven mountains and stuff. I think that's part of the confusion. But when we look at this and apply, just apply it today, if, we, if, if, if this were to happen right now, what makes sense? That's why I said, you know, if this happens in a couple hundred years, who knows? I mean, America go down the toilets and some other country can be extremely powerful and rich and lavish and buying all the world's goods and stuff. I don't know. I mean, sure, why not? I'm open to that. But for where we're at right now and the way things are going right now, it would make sense that this is a, a perfect picture of the United States of America. And it says in uh, verse 18, And cried when they saw that the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. Any question about how long it's going to take to destroy <laughs> the great horde? One hour. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. So this is also a place that is a, a source of um, plaguing the, the, the saints, right? Where, where people are being killed, by and large, are being martyred for the cause of Christ, I believe, during the tribulation period. I mean, that's what would make sense. So he's saying, you know, rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her of this great whore. And verse 21 says, And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. So it's talking about, again, using sorceries to deceive the nations. Using the, the, the tricks and, and the um, you know, witchcraft, basically, to deceive the nations. And I believe that's being done through media, through, through the, the culture and the, and the videos and stuff like that. So, um, seventh, or excuse me, yeah, Revelation chapter 17, 18 talks about Babylon. It talks about, the, turn if you would to Jeremiah chapter 15. It talks about this great whore and it talks about the beast. And where we're at right now, all of these descriptions in chapter 18 talking about that destruction, I don't see how you could come up with anything other than, than somewhere in the United States or United States as a whole. And you know, people don't like here in the United States to say, well, it, talks, it says a city, it doesn't say a nation. Okay, so I, don't, I don't think it's that big of an issue to refer to a, you know, a, a, a place, this location, kind of a bigger area as being a city, but um, you know, I'm, op I'm open to hearing what you think, too. I mean, you think it's a specific city? Bring, bring the proof. I like to see it. Turn if you go to Jeremiah chapter 50. We'll see another reference to the destruction of Babylon. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse number 34. Bible reads, Their Redeemer is strong. The Lord of hosts is his name. He shall thoroughly plead their cause that he may give rest to the land and disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. Now, before I keep reading here, I'm reading this and I should have enough context here in my notes to show you that this isn't just talking about Babylon back in the Old Testament days, right? The Chaldeans, the prophecies in the Old Testament, oftentimes you'll find dual meanings or you'll have partial meanings for back then with future prophetic references. This is one of those, or I believe, this is, this is talking about a future prophetic reference, and you'll see why in a few minutes. We'll keep reading here. Um, 
So let's reread there. Verse number 34, their Redeemer, their Redeemer is strong. The Lord of hosts is his name. He shall thoroughly plead their cause that he may give rest to the land and disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. A sword is upon the Chaldeans, saith the Lord, and upon the inhabitants of Babylon and upon her princes and upon her wise men. A sword is upon the liars and they shall dote. A sword is upon her mighty men and they shall be dismayed. A sword is upon their horses and upon their chariots and upon all the mingled people that are in the midst of her. And they shall become as women. A sword is upon her treasures, and they shall be robbed. A drought is upon her waters, and they shall be dried up. For it is the land of graven images, and they are mad upon their idols. Therefore the wild beasts of the desert, with the wild beasts of the islands, shall dwell there, and the owls shall dwell therein, and it shall be no more inhabited forever. Neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. This is talking about the destruction of Babylon and it's never, ever, ever going to be inhabited again. And it says it's not going to be dwelt in from generation to generation. It's going to be completely destroyed and wiped out. Look at verse number 40. Now we see a reference to Sodom and Gomorrah, which is just like we see in Matthew 24, a reference to days of Lot, right? As God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighbor cities thereof, saith the Lord, so shall no man abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell therein. Behold, a people shall come from the north and a great nation, and many kings shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth. Remember again, there was the, the, the ten kings that had committed fornication with the whore that end up turning on the whore on Babylon. A people from earth, a great nation, and many kings shall be raised up from the coast of the earth. They shall hold the bow and the lance. They are cruel and will not show mercy. Their voice shall roar like the sea, and they shall ride upon horses. Everyone put in array like a man to the battle against thee, O daughter of Babylon. The king of Babylon hath heard the report of them, and his hands waxed feeble. Anguish took hold of him in pangs as of a woman in travail. I believe that this is referencing the future destruction of the great whore, spiritual Babylon, that um, ultimately that, that's going to be residing in a place I believe is the United States and it will never be inhabited again. Now, just closing quickly, I kind of want to um, touch, turn if you would to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. To the best of my ability and knowledge and my understanding of the, of the Bible, I believe that this is talking about the United States. I mentioned that already. But there's also, I don't believe it's possible at all to say that this could be talking about Jerusalem for the great whore, for Babylon to be that city. I, I, and, I want, and because there's only a few kind of theories out there right now on, on this subject matter, I just want to, I want to throw this out there and give you this, this information because, you know, we're looking at this destruction and it's important to note that, hey, no, no one's ever going to, you know, it's going to be destroyed so that no one ever inhabits that land again. It's going to be desolate. It's, it's done. It's toast. If that's talking about Jerusalem, we've got a serious problem then because Jesus Christ is going to come and rule and reign in Jerusalem. That's what the Bible when, he, when Jesus Christ comes back and sets up his millennial kingdom on this earth, before there's a new heaven and a new earth, with this earth that, that goes through God's wrath and the tribulation and everything else, Jesus Christ is going to set up his millennial reign in Jerusalem, in the holy city. Now, Jerusalem is also the place where the Antichrist is going to be setting up his reign. He's going to be setting up the abomination of desolation, and it makes sense because he's an imposter. He is trying to be Jesus Christ. He is trying to fill those shoes and, and be the, the, the fake Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is going to come and rule and reign in Jerusalem. Well, the Antichrist is going to come first, and that's where he's going to reign from. That is the beast. That's where the beast is going to come from. It's from Jerusalem, which is why I said, you know, those seven mountains with the beast? That's fine to, to apply that to Jerusalem. I think there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not the same as the great whore. It's not the same as Babylon. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, the Bible reads, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, 
or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now I'm going to preach another sermon about the abomination of desolation. And it talks about the, the daily sacrifices being removed. We know, you know, I'm not going to take the time to prove it all tonight, but there's going to be a temple rebuilt. Solomon's temple, the third temple, is going to be rebuilt. And that is going to be the place. That's the place that the Bible is referring to in 2 Thessalonians 2 as being the temple of God, where the Antichrist is going to stand there proclaiming himself to be the second coming of Jesus Christ. I am God. And the abomination of desolation is going to be set up there. There's going to be that image, an idol brought in that people are going to have to be forced to worship and receive the mark of the, of the beast in the right hand or in their forehead. This is what's going to happen, but this is all going to be taking place in Jerusalem at that temple. And if you want to turn to Isaiah chapter 2, I'm just going to show, I just want to show you this this part, though, tonight, Isaiah chapter 2 prophesies the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, showing that his kingdom and his reign is going to be from Jerusalem. So you have the Antichrist reigning from there, who is a different authority and power than the great whore. I believe the, the Antichrist, the beast, the devil, props up the great whore and, and helps out the great whore to spread her filthiness and her fornication, but once the whore is used and has served her purpose, and she's done, she's destroyed. She's wiped out. Everyone hates her anyways. No one loves a whore. No, you know, these men that go out, just, I mean, there's a physical whore. They go out and, and, and hire a prostitute. They don't love them. They get what they want out of them. They use them and they're done with them. They don't care about them anymore after that. The whore goes whoring around and, and the great whore in the Bible, goes whoring around with all the various kingdom, you know, kings and kingdoms and spews her filth and her fornication to everyone. And then everyone just ends up hating this stupid whore and wants her, wants her out of the way. That's not where the power is going to be residing. The true power is coming from anyways. I believe that's going to be in Jerusalem. You're going to have the Antichrist set up there first. And then after all of the, the God's pouring out his wrath and stuff and he's finally defeated and thrown into the, the, the lake of fire, then Jesus Christ comes and sets up his kingdom in Jerusalem. In Isaiah chapter 2, we'll see that. Look at verse number 1. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. Another reference to mountains. Look at that. And shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. And we walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Very clearly talking about the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. This hasn't happened yet, where God's going to set up in Jerusalem, he's going to be the lawgiver. Everything's going to come and go the way, you know, the way that he says it is. All nations of the earth are going to come unto him to hear the law, to hear the truth. And there's going to be no more war. It's going to be a time of peace. The swords are going to be beaten into, into plowshares, into pruning hooks. The weapons are going to be gone because you don't need a weapon because you're going to be serving the king who doesn't need a standing army. This is from Jerusalem. Now, if Jerusalem was destroyed and not inhabited during God's wrath being poured out, how can you have Jesus Christ ruling and reigning from there inhabiting Jerusalem? You'd have a contradiction. So that's why I don't think it's Jerusalem at all. I, th I, think, it, I think it completely um, is just, it's not possible. But could it be Rome? I don't think so. Not, not, the way, not the way that Revelation 18 describes the destruction of, of Babylon. For our time, where we're at right now, I mean, and look, throughout history, could it have been Rome? Sure. Absolutely. 
mean, you look at all the martyrs and in, 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 in the Inquisition and all, you know, there's the various things going on. The Roman Catholic Church, the power that they wielded. I mean, before the United States even became a power, where, where was all the commerce and all the consumption and everything else being made? It was being made there. I mean, it's just, but where we're at right now in history, I don't think you could look at anything else than, than the United States for, uh, for looking at, at Babylon. So we're going to continue doing these various topics. Um, I might dip into this a little bit more or touch on some, some various topics as we go into different things. But um, this is interesting. I mean, this, there's a lot... I, I try not to read like what other people write on all this stuff because you find I found in the past when I've looked up a lot of different people that like you'll find all kinds of stuff all over the place. People believe all kinds of weird things and and I would recommend for you do your own study. I, I recommend this last week when I talk about this. Go through the book of Revelation. Go through the various books that, that are, have prophetic scriptures Write them out. Write down a synopsis of what they're talking about. Try to get your timeline figured out of when these events are going to happen. And then just look at it and say, well, we're, how does this figure out? Who is the Bible talking about here? You know, people want to go on and on about how Russia is Gog and, you know, Magog. And, you know, it's like, no. You know, that's not even that. Get your timeline down first. You realize that that doesn't happen until after the millennial reign of Christ. You're not going to be worried about about Gog and Magog. But um, anyways, let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, um, for your words. We thank you for the revelation, for the revealing of what's going to happen in the end times. Dear God, we just pray that you would please continue to instruct us and teach us and that you would um, help us to know the truth, that we could be well prepared, that we could teach others, dear Lord, the, the, the things that are to come. And even though um, we personally won't, won't be here probably to experience the destruction of Babylon because I don't think that happens until after you start pouring out your wrath on this world, dear Lord. It's uh, still important to understand the, the, the course of events and the way things are going to happen, dear Lord, and that um, we could have that knowledge and use that knowledge to serve you better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.